Eso, Daniel, ¿existe ese grupo de élite o no existe? Sí, existe. Existe y gobierna y manda. Y es una cosa que muy poca gente entiende y desde luego mucho menos personas uh, se dan cuenta que los gobiernos al final no mandan en nada más allá de la política local. O sea, que gobiernan a los gobiernos. Son capaces de poner incluso a quienes van a gobernar. Poner y quitar a los presidentes y, por supuesto, hacer la política a corto y a largo plazo. ¿Tú no crees entonces que exista lo que llamamos generalmente democracia? No, no, ex no existe la democracia. La democracia es un concepto inventado por esa gente porque es una cosa muy, muy útil y cómoda para utilizarlo, para quitar y poner las personas que tú quieres. Porque al final la democracia parlamentaria en el día de hoy está basada en tres cosas. Tienes el presidente y el Congreso o el Parlamento, que puedes quitar o poner dependiendo si montas o desmontas algún tipo de crisis. Y la tercera parte de toda esta historia, por supuesto, es el dinero. Es decir, poderes fácticos financieros que tienen muchísimo más poder que cualquier gobierno en la Tierra. Dicho eso, lo que hoy se llama Bilderberg, que tampoco es una sociedad secreta, sino un grupo privado, ahora mucho menos privado que antes, gracias a mis libros y mis millones de libros que he vendido, son ex, lo que se llama ex-alianza de OTAN. Uh, Europa Occidental, Estados Unidos y Canadá. Entre los 120 miembros que van todos los años tienes los presidentes primer ministros de todos esos países, a los top 50 60 consejeros delegados de las empresas más grandes, los banqueros principales del mundo occidental, um, director general de Fondo Monetario Internacional, Banco Mundial, Reserva Federal Americana, um, um, algunos uh, uh, digamos, uh, uh, parlamentarios europeos y con ellos se sienten en esta mesa grande de 120 personas, las familias reales europeas y también los principales medios de comunicación. Y por eso hasta, hasta que yo empecé sacando el tema de la luz, nadie se había escuchado hablar. De, de este club.
reptilians. And it's, it's, it's an atmosphere, it's an energy, because, you know, you can, you can, um, it's why becoming sensitive to this is, is so important, because you can manipulate people with words, you can manipulate people with smiley faces, but you cannot hide your energy field, right? You can put the front on, you cannot hide your energy field. And one of, one of the things that I've noticed, again, with the eyes, is when I look at these people, which, which I would say are absolutely reptilian, people like Tony Blair and uh, um, Hillary Clinton and uh, uh, others that uh, have the same kind of, kind of ilk, um, what do you call it? Um, or the Browns and Browns. Yeah, what do you call it? Um, Barack Obama. No matter what their face is doing, smiling, happy, slappy, their eyes don't change. There's this cold stare in their eyes, which they're, they're, whatever their face is doing, that never changes. I, I say that's this, this reptilian archon force as well. It is really puzzling to me that having just buried one monster, the Soviet Union, another remarkably similar one, the European Union, is being built. Exactly what is the European Union? Perhaps by examining the Soviet version we can get the answer. The Soviet Union was governed by 15 unelected people who appointed each other and who were not accountable to anyone. The European Union is governed by two dozen people who appoint each other, meet in secret, and are not accountable to anyone and whom we cannot sack. One might say that the EU has an elected parliament. Well, the Soviet Union had a parliament of a sort too, the Supreme Soviet, which just rubber stamped the Politburo decisions. Pretty much like the European Parliament does, where speaking time in the chamber is limited within each group and often amounts to one minute per, per speaker. In the EU, there are hundreds of thousands of bureaucrats with their huge salaries, their staff, servants, bonuses and privileges, their lifelong immunity from prosecution, which is simply shuffled from one position to another, no matter what they do or fail to do. Is this not exactly like the Soviet regime? The Soviet Union
the euro system. It's lost it. So therefore, we, what we have to think about is if you want to save civilization, you have to get rid of problems like Obama. You cannot, fool, you cannot have Obama, and you certainly don't want the other creeps or the Republican creeps. So the question is, we have to immediately. We are now, we're now faced with, as a planet, and a people of the planet, with the greatest threat to mankind, which probably has ever existed. We are hovering at present, since the murder of the former president of Libya, Muammar Gaddafi. We've been hovering ever since then on the verge of going into new wars, into Libya and into Iran. And the intent of those new wars was to trigger a larger war, which would become the launching of a thermonuclear war, featuring the role, assigned role, of the United States under President Obama to launch a general thermonuclear war on Russia, China, and other nations. Such a war as understand that Russia would respond with thermonuclear response on the first instance of the evidence of such an assault upon it and China, and China similarly, and other case, nations probably similarly. As long as this president, with his current pre intention, President Obama, continues in office, the threat of that warfare continues. countries that you put sanctions on, you are more likely to fight them. I say a policy of peace is free trade, stay out of their internal business, don't get involved in these wars, and just bring our troops home. So we tolerated the Soviets, we didn't attack them, and they were a much greater danger. They were the greatest danger to us in, in our whole history. But you don't go to war against them. I mean, this whole idea of sanctions, all these pretend free traders, they're the ones who put on these trade sanctions. This is why we still don't have trade relationships with Cuba. It's about time we talk to Cuba and stop fighting these wars that are about 30 or 40 years old. I have a few questions for my uh, colleagues. What if our foreign policy of the past century is deeply flawed and has not served our national security interests? What if we wake up one day and realize that the terrorist threat is a predictable consequence of our meddling in the affairs of others and has nothing to do with us being free and prosperous? What if propping up regi repressive regimes in the Middle East endangers both the United States and Israel? What if occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan and bombing Pakistan is directly related to the hatred directed toward us? What if someday it dawns on us that losing over 5,000 American military personnel in the Middle East since 
is not a fair trade-off for the loss of nearly 3,000 American citizens, no matter how many Iraqi, Pakistani, and Afghan people are killed. What if all wartime spending is paid for through the deceitful and evil process of inflating and borrowing? What if conservatives understood once again that their only logical position is to reject military intervention and managing an empire throughout the world? What if a military draft is being planned for for the wars that will spread if our foreign policy is not changed? What if the American people learn the truth? That our foreign policy has nothing to do with national security. That it never changes from one administration to the next. Nigel Farage, uh, President of the Europe of Freedom and Democracy. When we had a president, we'd see a giant global political figure. The man that would be the political leader for 500 million people. The man that would represent all of us on the world stage. The man whose job was so important that, of course, you're paid more than President Obama. Well, I'm afraid what we got was you. And I'm sorry, but after that performance earlier that you gave, and I don't want to be rude, but, but, you know, really, you have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you, lot. And uh, what mechanism do the peoples of Europe have Mr. to remove President. you? Is this European democracy? Well, I, I sense, uh, I sense well, though, that you're competent and capable and dangerous. And I have no doubt that it's your intention to be the quiet assassin of European democracy and of the European nation states. You appear to have a loathing for the very concept of the existence of nation states. But since you took over, we've seen Greece reduced to nothing more than a protectorate. Sir, you have no legitimacy in this job at all, and I can say with confidence that I can speak on behalf of the majority of the British people in saying, we don't know you, we don't want you, and the sooner you're put out to grass, the better.
So he said that when they get a microchip inside you, basically they're chipping a computer um, in the sense that they're operating. And therefore, they can manipulate the computer electrically, electromagnetically, and chemically to, from a distance, to manipulate people mentally, emotionally, and physically. So once you get a, a, one of these chips inside you, they can take you out from a distance. Um, they can destabilize your body so you get illnesses which take you out or, or um, uh, make your life more difficult. They can manipulate you emotionally so that you become aggressive or docile and subservient. And they can manipulate your thoughts. So, because on one level, of course, when you have a thought, it's an electrical um, uh, sequence that happens. Thought waves, electrical pulses. And what they're doing is now introducing chipping around the world. Yo, 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 yo,